every day. We get things off the ground, keeping you connected and secure. We keep things running smoothly and know the importance of giving back. We're always looking at the bigger picture. We are ARA, reliable solutions for facilities and infrastructure. Welcome to Everyday Greatness and thanks for watching. I'm your host, Barnaby Howard. This is a show designed to help people realise there is greatness in being in everyday Harry Sacker roles. We're live today at Glebe Point Park in Sydney. We're sitting outside a French restaurant, which is so exclusive, I haven't been given the name or the opening date. So if you like French food and restaurants that are in spectacular locations, come and loiter around Glebe Point Park for a couple of weeks. And hopefully that coincides with the opening date of this restaurant and you can be one of the first customers. I'm going to be speaking today about how big things can happen when you start by simply taking care of your family and neighbours. My appreciation for the greatness of an everyday life was heightened when in 2005 I was bashed in an alcohol fuelled gang attack and had a stroke. I was put on life support which my parents were told they might have to turn off. My family and friends were told to come and say goodbye. Obviously I did pull through but I now appreciate my simple everyday existence more than I ever thought was possible. When I go down to the shops to get milk these days, I think it's such an incredible adventure, I feel like giving people high fives when I walk out. One of the worst parts about having a stroke is that you lose your short term memory. So you just go blank every now and then, which has just happened to me. Bear with me. As well as, being a, as well as being a stroke survivor, I'm also a type 1 diabetic and in 2016 I lost the most beautiful person in my world, my wife Angela, to breast cancer. I'm also a keynote speaker talking about resilience. I've been travelling the world spreading my message that as long as you can get home at the end of every day, look yourself in the mirror and say you couldn't have tried any harder than you did whether you end up being the best person in the world at what you're trying or not, you can, push, you can lift your head up, push your shoulders back and walk down the street proud of the person you are. I've been pulled up quite a few times over the years with people telling me that message wasn't strong enough. And it sounds like you're encouraging people to accept second best or celebrate mediocrity. I've been trying to, I've been, I've been trying to argue against that point quite a few times but I haven't been able to find that one simple metaphor that explains my message. But I've just recently thought of what that metaphor is. That metaphor is diabetes. When people are diagnosed with diabetes, nobody in the world tries to be the best diabetic that ever lived. They just play the hand they're dealt as well as they possibly can. And if they're managing their condition as well as they think they can, they can be, a, they can be proud of the diabetic they are, knowing that in diabetes, there is no winning or losing. A living, breathing example of this is Caitlin Gooding. Caitlin was diagnosed with diabetes at the age of nine. And what that meant for Caitlin was that she essentially lost her mojo. Caitlin seemed to be getting further and further away from the person she wanted to be. She stopped doing things she loved and she dropped out of high school. But last year, Caitlin was granted a scholarship to go on the Jelly Bean Cruise hosted by the Danny Foundation. The Jelly Bean Cruise is a diabetes education cruise where young diabetics and their families go on a p and cruise around the South Pacific with other diabetics and their families, doctors, diabetes educators, medical reps and psychologists. Most of them get on the boat thinking that they're fighting this diabetes battle on their own, but they get off with, they get off with friendships of people who are suffering from the same struggles they are. On this cruise last year, Caitlin found her mojo. She sang a couple of songs in the karaoke, karaoke part of the, the ship, and off the back of that, she was asked to sing at the Danny Foundation's gala fundraising ball, where she wowed a crowd of 500 people with her two songs and gave an incredible speech. 
Caitlin has been doing some big things since she found her mojo, but she hasn't been doing them alone. Caitlin's mother, Sharon, took time off work to, to look after Caitlin while she was at the depth of her struggles with diabetes. Sharon, is, Sharon Gooding is possibly one of the proudest mothers on the face of the earth right now. And I'm proud to say, I'm pleased to say that Sharon joined us now. Sharon Gooding, welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Barnaby. <laughs> Before I start, though, I believe you have something you want to say. I do indeed. Thank you. Look, I'd just like to thank Paul Lavings um, from Studio Blue for all of his design work and he's a really great bloke. So, yeah, thanks, Paul. So. Thanks, Paul. So, does it feel weird being referred to as Caitlin's mum these days? That's my lot in life. <laughs> That's my lot in life. And as you said, I'm the proudest mother on earth. But, yeah, look, there, there are struggles and there are wonderful times. And, Thankfully, since the, since the Jelly Bean Cruise, we're living the wonderful times. So, yeah, it's all good. So how did you feel when your daughter was diagnosed with diabetes at nine years of age? That's a hard... <laughs> oh, Barnaby, how did I feel? I felt like my world was ending. It was awful. My um, husband's, mate's husband's family had a lot of diabetes in it, so I did know a little bit about what we were facing. Uh, I also had gestational diabetes, so I knew a little bit about that as well. So putting all of that together, honestly, it had really felt like, I knew at that moment our life had changed forever. I just, at that point, I didn't really know just how much it was going to change. But yeah, it, it's, not a, it's not something I want any family to ever have to experience, not much. So diabetes changes things up fairly significantly in emotions and, and mental issues. But how did things change around your household? I'm tipping your grocery shopping was a lot different. Um, well, at the beginning it was. At the beginning it was. Um, we obviously we needed to learn how to live with diabetes in our lives. Um, something I probably would say I didn't do terribly well at the time. But yes, we you know the time you had to have dinner on the table at a particular time. Um, you do need to be. We needed to be much more careful about who, you know, what we put in in her mouth. Um, predominantly it was really about learning how to do the carbohydrate thing um, and understanding how that affected her blood glucose levels in order to be able to manage it as effectively as we can and that was hard when you've never been exposed to that before that was that was very very difficult I have food allergies and that doesn't it doesn't compare at all it, it is a very difficult thing. yeah so you have a background in mental health how would you have prescribed Caitlin if she came to see you as a private patient? Well, look, I didn't have a background in mental health then. Um, I have since gone back to school and studied um, a lot of mental health. We have a lot of mental health issues in the family. Um, look, I, I missed it. It's a, there, I can't be any more honest than that, I missed it. Uh, I didn't realise just what that effect of the diagnosis had had on Caitlin. Being age nine, I thought I was still in control of that, but... Um, yeah, I, I didn't have a clue how that was affecting her until very recently. I went back to school in order to understand uh, what was she was going through and um, in order to look at youth work and mental health to be able to try and help her bring her back um, into the living world again. And, um, you know, whilst I learnt a lot, I've learnt more from her. It was, yeah, it, it hasn't been an easy ride, but one I think we can both take with us through life, so. Yeah. So explain for us what struggles Caitlin has gone through and what she's going through. Are you prepared for me to? Go for it. <laughs> um, okay, so I guess when she hit high school, things started to come undone a little bit. Uh, by year nine, Caitlin had completely pretty much disengaged with school altogether. Uh, there were some very, very dark days. Um, there were thoughts of not wanting to be here. Um, not wanting to live at all anymore. There were um, uh, times of rage. There were times of just complete shutdown in life. Just wasn't prepared to participate in anything. She gave up. She's an amazing singer, um, and she and she loved her drama and everything. She just sort of gave up overnight. Just decided that it wasn't worth pursuing. That she wasn't good enough. Her confidence levels just dived. Uh, it was a really really tough time quite a few hospitalizations um, which sort of prompted me then to make the decision that I needed to be at home with her full time in order to help her. So what, what changes did you make in your own personal life 
to be by your little girl's side to help her with her struggles? Well, I left a career as an executive at executive level in the public service. Um, I took a voluntary redundancy in order to stay home and uh, lived on a pension for a while, which was a, a whole <laughs> a whole other experience, one I haven't had to experience before. But um, I I literally stopped everything. I did go back to school. I had my schooling whilst um, I did a lot of that from home, obviously, so that I could be there. But now it was a full year. It was a very, very full year, but it was one I wouldn't turn back time on at all. It was, it was necessary, but it was also an intense learning experience for us both. And it has given us our relationship that we have today, which we've got a very close relationship and I wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah. So in your, in your view, what was Caitlin's mindset before she got on the Jelly Bean Cruise last year? Oh. She didn't care about anything. She didn't care about anything. And that was, that's the bottom line. She um, had pretty much just, she'd actually come to a place of acceptance where it was, she'd gone through all the really bad behaviors. We had started to turn around on that, but the, um, she, she still hadn't got a real zest for anything. She wasn't prepared to be passionate about anything, to be actively participating in anything at all. And what, how would you describe Caitlin's mindset right now sitting next to you? My daughter is one of the most amazing people I know. And it's not just from a mother's perspective. It's, she really is. She is an amazing person. She is a big advocate now for diabetes. I just love it when she walks out. Most parents will say, you know, midriff shirts and things. <laughs> no, no, no. But I actually, I love seeing her. She's proud to be to show her diabetes. She'll talk to everybody and anybody about her diabetes, which uh, she owns it now. Whereas before she rejected it, she now owns it. She has got a lot more confidence. She's been given some amazing opportunities that many young people, you know, aren't going, don't get those opportunities. Uh, it has raised her confidence levels. But I think the thing that gives me most joy is, is that she has, she's now reliving her singing again. She's brought that back into her life and it, it it's brought it back into both our lives, which is, you know, incredible. And she's very talented. As you know, Barnaby, she's very talented. So how did this turnaround happen from the person you described before the Jelly Bean Cruise? How has this turnaround happened that she's now confident and singing and doing things she loves? Look, I think that's probably a question you might like to ask her when you when you interview her. Um, look, I can only see it from my end and, and what, what she is prepared to sort of share with me. But, um, Look, I think she has just, the cruise gave her the opportunity to be around other people like her. Um, it gave her the opportunity to be exposed to other people, to be given these opportunities and, you know, to really sort of build that confidence back within herself. Nothing, her mother can't ask for more than that. So you mentioned briefly the Danny Foundation. What impact has that foundation had on yours and your daughter's life? I contacted Donna, um, not the foundation, I contacted Donna. I got given her number um, by, I, actually I think it was um, one of the pump companies gave me, I was looking into CGM and continuous glucose monitoring and they actually gave me Donna's personal number and I rang Donna and told her about our story and it has kind of unfolded from there. So we have been given amazing opportunities. Um, but it, it's been that support that the Danny Foundation and the communities that have been built around the Danny Foundation by way of the Facebook pages and you know we have a real network now from the people that were on the cruise etc so you know whenever I'm feeling a little bit um, overwhelmed by it all I've got communities that we can sort of um, feed it off which is amazing and now that we've experienced and lived a lot of this we can actually share our experiences with other people as well yeah so that's great so Caitlin sang two songs in karaoke on the, on the cruise ship and she just performed in front of a crowd of 500. How did you feel as a mother sitting in the back row watching your daughter wow audiences? Not surprised at all. Not surprised at all. I always knew she, I, I've lived with this job, I've lived <laughs> with this young person for, for a long, long time. And um, I always knew she had the talent and I always knew she had it. But being able to watch her up there and have that confidence displayed out there in front of all the world to see, well, I can't be more proud of Barnaby. She's, she's an amazing young person, amazing young person. When you decided to take time off work or leave work to look after your daughter, did you do it because you thought huge things might happen in her life and she might sing karaoke and in front of gala balls? No, I did it to keep her alive. That's the honest truth. 
I did it to keep her alive. I was not prepared to, um, after everything we've sort of been through and everything she goes through on a daily basis. I, I'm, look, carers go through a lot as well. They do, and there is no denying that. Um, and I had to do it for my sake as much as for her sake, you know. I wasn't prepared to lose her. I wasn't prepared to sacrifice her in um, to this disease. So uh, I just, you know, it was a no-brainer at the end of the day. It took a while for me to make the decision. I wish I had made it probably earlier. But, you know, it, we are given, we're given the opportunities at the moment we need it most. I, I truly believe that. And I believe that the opportunity to um, be able to take that time off and be at home with her in her darkest place, um, it was a blessing. So Caitlin is an incredible singer. I've got to ask you before you go, is that genetic? <laughs> Once upon a time it might have been, but no, it's, <laughs> I'm living my life precariously through her now, Barbie. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, Sharon Gooding, I think you're an incredible human being and a wonderful mother. And thank I thank you. you so much for being on Everyday Greatness. Lovely. Now thank we can do so the much. Everyday Greatness shuffle and get Caitlin in the hot chair. Wonderful. Thank, thank you, you so much. No Ciao. problem. Caitlin Gooding, welcome. Hello. So, Caitlin Gooding, before she got on, she's a, Caitlin Gooding is an incredible young diabetic. And that's largely because Caitlin doesn't think she's an incredible young diabetic. Before she got on the Jelly Bean Cruise last year, Caitlin was further away from the person she wanted to be than she probably ever has been. But on the cruise, on a workshop on one of the last days, Caitlin walked into the room and sat in the very back row by herself, not mixing with anybody. But as other young diabetics got up the front on and grabbed the microphone and told their stories about how this crew, the Jelly Bean Cruise, hosted by Danny, had changed their attitudes towards diabetes, Caitlin started making her way towards the front, row by row, until eventually she got up the front, grabbed the microphone and told us all her story. One of the things Caitlin said was that one of the things she missed the most since being diagnosed with diabetes was singing. Then later that night on the cruise ship, there was a karaoke station and Caitlin put her name down, got up and sang a song in a beautifully angelic voice. She repeated, she repeated the karaoke the following night and off the back of that, she was asked to sing two songs at the, at the Jelly Bean Ball, the gala fundraising ball hosted by the Danny Foundation. Caitlin has since found her mojo, and she is an incredible young diabetic, and she joins us now. Caitlin, thank you for joining us. No worries at all. Before I start, I believe you have something you want to say, though. I do indeed. I just wanted to say happy birthday, Donna. Um, she turned 45 this year, and I hope you had an incredible time in Teppanyaki. Happy birthday, Donna. So just take diabetes out of your story for a second. Describe for us the person you were when you were eight years old before you were diagnosed with diabetes. I reckon I was one of the most annoying kids in my <laughs> class. Um, I was kind of that girl who had to sing everything that she did. Um, like if she had to pick up a pencil, you'd have to sing, hey, I'm picking up a pencil now. Um, yeah, no, I was, I was, I was really, free-spirited I just didn't really care all that much about what people thought of me and yeah all right so let's put diabetes back in your story how did you feel when you were diagnosed I completely changed I was the complete opposite I cared about what everybody thought of me even if people weren't thinking of me like even if they were just looking at me because I was walking past them um, I would think oh my god they can see my pump they can see they can tell that I'm different they can tell I've got diabetes and yeah, I was I, from eight years old being completely careless to nine years old caring about everything. It was pretty intense. So tell me how you were, how you were diagnosed. What made you find out you were diabetic? Um, well, mum had her suspicions quite early on, but when she took me to the doctor, I was actually misdiagnosed. Um, I was told that I had low protein and that I should start eating more nuts. And of course, nuts have carbohydrates in them, so it just made everything worse. And um, I just got sicker and sicker. And then I was going to my school swimming carnival and I stupidly signed up for um, the 50 meters race. Um, and mum was like, okay, we need to take you to a pool and see if you can actually swim this. So we did, I got in the pool about 
10 meters in, I just dropped. I was numb. Like I couldn't, I couldn't move. Mum actually had to dive into the pool and pull me out. Um, and on our way back home, she, she, she picked me up and she put me straight in the car. She was like, we, we need to go home now. Um, on the way home, we stopped into a little cafe and we got um, something to eat. And I picked up within half an hour. Um, and then by the time we got home, my uncle has type two diabetes. So he had the tester pack and everything and mum had her suspicions. So she was like, okay, we need to, we need to test this. And we, I just need this peace of mind. And we did, and the monitor wouldn't even read my levels. Um, so she called the hospital. She's like, what do we do? They told her to bring me straight in. And I was then diagnosed with type one diabetes. So your mum talked about your struggles with your mental health issues over the years. Yeah. And I won't ask you to repeat those. I know they were pretty heavy. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> How, what did you do in your life to try and get through those struggles though? Honestly, I don't think I've done a lot. I think I've just sort of, I just sort of sit there, um, hoping that it'll go away. And I, I know that it won't, but um, that's sort of my way of coping with it. Like I just kind of want to sit down and just not deal with anything. But like generally I'll, if I'm feeling really bad, I'll play some music or I'll sing a little bit. Um, and that will, it'll either cheer me up a little bit or it'll put me to sleep. So. <laughs> so your mum was talking about her phone conversation with Donna from the Danny Foundation. When and how did the Danny Foundation come into your life? Um, I don't remember exactly, but what the first thing I do remember is mum telling me that we had a scholarship to go to the Jelly Bean Ball um, and that this was oh, a couple, three years ago, I think. Um, maybe four, but she was like, hey, we're going to this ball for diabetes and like there's going to be a heap of other diabetics there, you're going to meet Donna, you're going to, um, you're just going to learn a lot and we went and that was sort of the beginning I found. Um, it was the start of learning that I wasn't the only one with diabetes. And did you receive any any large um, prizes at that or things come out no. of that don't no. fall? <laughs> um, it, like I said, it was just the beginning. So I, like, I was at that point sort of like, I don't, like mum said, I don't really want to be here. Um, and like, I, just, I just don't really care. So it was kind of, that was my introduction to what things could be like. And yes, yeah, so honestly, I don't remember much of it because I was still sort of in that headspace where I didn't really care about anything. I wasn't putting any effort into remembering anything. And yes, yeah, so, but I do believe it was the beginning. So this scholarship you got to go on the Jelly Bean Cruise, it sounds like you just got it out of, out of thin air and it just popped up out of magic. How did it actually happen? Um, again, I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> that was all mum. She, I'm not sure why she did it, but it was a huge surprise for me. And just, she was so happy when it happened and it just, it, it all happened at once. And she was just so happy and yeah, that made me happy and yeah. And what was your mindset before going on the cruise last year? Very dark, very, very dark. Um, I, I just wasn't coping. I was sort of, at that point I was trying to change myself. Like I had gotten out of the slump of not doing anything. And then I decided that my body and my looks and my face wasn't good enough. So at that point I was trying to like change myself. I was trying new makeups. I was trying new hairstyles. And then I got on the cruise and it just, it didn't matter. It didn't matter what I looked like because we were on a boat. Just, it just didn't matter, um, and yeah, so. So you ended up singing karaoke twice on that boat. Yeah. Were, you, were you nervous before you, you sang? I wasn't the first time because I didn't really know anyone there, 
Um, then the second time I knew quite a couple of people who were going to be there and it was a little bit nerve wracking, but um, I, I knew what I was doing. It's singing's my thing, I know what I'm doing, so. Well, if it's your thing, do you want to give us a taste of <laughs> how your pipes operate? Can you just bust out a, just a chorus? Um, yeah. Tell them how I am defying gravity. I'm flying high, defying gravity, and you can't pull me down. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. So what was your mindset when you stepped off the cruise last year? A lot brighter. It was, um, it was really like, so I was coming back into Sydney, I was going home to Canberra, and I just kind of thought, hey, this isn't so bad. Like the diabetes isn't so bad. I can, I can handle this a little bit better. I picked up a couple of tips and tricks from other diabetics my age. Um, and yeah, it just, it got easier. So when you were at your lowest point in your diabetes struggle, where did you think you were gonna end up years down the track? I didn't think there was gonna be years down the track. Honest to God didn't think there was. I was at that point where it's going to sound very dark and very horrible, but I was ready to end it. I was ready to just stop and not have to do anything else with my life. Well, I'm glad you didn't. Um, so am I. <laughs> how important has it been that your mum's been by your side every step um, of the way? It's been so important to me. It's, um, it's really special because I, I've got, a, I know a couple of people who don't, just don't, doesn't have that support. Um, and I'm just so lucky that I was able to have someone as incredible as her being by my side the entire time and someone as brave as her to be able to leave such a, a, an exclusive job um, to come home and take care of me. And yeah, it was just really incredible. So you're now a fairly prominent spokesperson for diabetes and you like to get the word out there. Yes, what, I am. What are you involved in? Um, well, at the moment, uh, I'm currently sort of, sort of waiting on the um, Danny Foundation because I'll be going on the next Jelly Bean cruise as part of the crew, a part of the um, workers, and I'll be an ambassador for the Danny Foundation. So I'll be speaking for them. I'll be speaking to people who want to, like, aren't really sure about what Danny Foundation is and like want to know what diabetes is. And like yesterday, um, I was just at the mall and we were going clothes shopping and I walked into one of the stores and one, the ladies, one of the ladies who was working saw my pump because it was, it was just hanging in the open, it was fine. Um, and she was like, hang on, what, what's that? And I started, I started explaining to her what diabetes was and she had kids of her own and um, it actually got very emotional. Um, and yeah, and like I was just, I was just kind of rambling on about the diabetes and I was just like, you know, I kind of like doing this. I'm, I'm okay with doing this. And yeah, I'm just talking about it with other people trying to get the word across saying, this is what diabetes is. It's not because I've eaten too much sugar. Sometimes it's because I haven't eaten <laughs> enough sugar. Um, but yeah. So when you, when you found your mojo, and you got your confidence and you could you know, do these huge things, the karaoke and the singing in a, in a fundraising ball. Do you sit down in the morning and aim to do big things or you just play the hand as well as you can? Most of the time I just play the hand. Like I, um, I suppose I'll sort of have those moments where I'll think about it and I'll be like, I could actually do something with my life. I could actually, like, I could actually go far in this and I could deliberately make this a living. Um, but then other times I'm just like, hey, this is fun. Let's, let's go and sing over at the ball over here. Let's go and sing at a little party over here. And, and then I just continue on with my teenager life, just like going to school, catching up with friends. And so then, yeah. When you stepped down from doing these big things, like singing at the ball in front of 500 people, how did you feel when you got off the stage? Oh, I was shaking. Like I got such an incredible reaction like I suppose because I've been I've been hearing my voice since the day I was born so I don't really think it's 
anything all that special. Um, but then other people hear my voice and they're just like, you've actually got something there. And I'm just like, oh, oh, <laughs> shucks. <laughs> um, I don't know, like I just got such a good reaction and it just made me feel so, so good about myself. Um, and it just made me want to keep going, made me want to keep doing it. So let's put diabetes back into your story now. How would you describe yourself today? Um, I suppose I'm, I'm a bit of a rat bag. I, uh, I, I, am, I am a teenager. I don't do the best with my diabetes. Like I'll forget to give my insulin here. Or I'll forget to take my levels over here or whatever. But I do believe I am doing better than what I was three years ago. Um, and my perspective on life has just gone right up and just getting through it day to day. Well, Caitlin Gurry, you just made me feel better about what I'm doing. <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us on no Everyday Greatness. Now we're going to do the Everyday Greatness Shuffle. Let's do it. But thank you again. Thank and you. beautiful voice, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're not going to ask me to sing. <laughs> oh, maybe. <laughs> Dr. Kate Armstrong is the founder and president of CLAN, an Australian NGO that is committed to bring equality to children and adolescents living with chronic health conditions in resource poor countries. Dr. Armstrong has written a paper for the United Nations Secretary General's high level panel on access to medicines. And CLAN is a driving force behind the United Nations Every Woman, Every Child movement. Dr. Armstrong and Clan are like Ron Burgundy. They're kind of a big deal. But Clan started with a simple desire for Kate to take care of her firstborn child. Kate's eldest son was born with a chronic health condition. But being treated in Australia, he was treated and stabilised without a lot of fuss. He's now living a life as normal as any other, oh, sorry, hates that word normal, as regular as any other <laughs> life. Time. As, as a 19 year old kid. He just played Aussie Rules footy this morning. The game of the gods. The game of the gods. <laughs> so, Clan started from very humble beginnings, but it's now saving children's lives in these resource poor countries. Because a couple of years after Kate's son was diagnosed with his chronic condition, Kate found out that kids born with the same condition in resource poor countries like Vietnam were dying. So Clan was born, he's now saving the lives of children in these resource poor countries. It's a pleasure to say that Dr. Kate Armstrong joins us now. Thank you, Kate, welcome. Thank you. Before I start, I believe you have something you want to say as well. I do. I'd like to wish Madeline Kelly a really happy birthday. And uh, your parents are very, very proud of you. So have a great day. Happy birthday, Maddie. <laughs> so you're kind of a big deal. Do you feel like you are? No, and especially not sitting here with Sharon and Caitlin. I don't, and yourself, but no, I don't. Uh, it's wonderful to hear their stories, and I'm really inspired to hear Caitlin and her personal diabetes. Uh, and the stuff I'm doing. So I think, yeah, getting to meet. I've been doing it the whole time. Yeah, that makes noise. Uh, uh, through the work that I am, I do get to meet. You know, uh, that's so cute. So tell us what CLAN, C-L-A-N, stands for and what that represents. Yeah, CLAN stands for Caring and Living in Our Status. And uh, when our son was about five years old, he needed to take medicine three times a day. Uh, and with that medicine, I guess it's a bit like this. He takes that medicine. He is, um, you know, to live a high Um But without that medicine, he would die. He'd be like a diabetic. I hope it didn't just break my mind. Stories of children living with um, his condition in Vietnam. And they were dying. And they were disabled. Yeah, and they were um, experiencing terrible side effects of the condition. And the concept was that if uh, I was living in my street in Sydney and I knew that my neighbour's child had the same condition as my son and he'd run out of his medicine, I'd pop down the street and I'd go and give them some, I'd share some of Jane's medicine. And uh, it wasn't such a long stretch to think about our neighbours in neighbouring countries as neighbours as you would think about neighbours down the street. And, and how can we share our medicine and everything that we have that enables our children to be Australia to such, you know, the best lives that we can live in this 
So you guys share more than just medicine stuff. You share information. And I believe you have some that explains your son's condition with you now. Well, he's probably the only one who could read this. But yes, this is an example. Um, so uh, and, uh, we travel to Vietnam and we listen to families. And families, you know, like Sharon, um, and we spoke to all the parents in Vietnam, and we said, why is it you're having such a hard time helping your child have a good life? Well, the parents said, we need access to affordable medicine and equipment. We need education, research and advocacy. <coughs> We need access to the highest quality of care, medical tr treatment that we can get. We want strong support groups. We want to meet other people like the Jelly Bean crews who are living with the same condition. And we're just bankrupt. We need to be financially independent. We need to escape poverty. So we listened to the communities and what they told us. And one of the things they said was they need um, information. And when we went to Vietnam and we were working with the diabetes community, for example, they didn't have any written information in Vietnamese language about how to manage type 1 diabetes and it's, you know, <laughs> it's a complex condition to look after. Equally, um, our son's condition. So we translated um, what, what is really in Australia, the Bible for caring for your child with type 1 diabetes into Vietnamese language and it really has transformed and empowered communities and health professionals to care better for themselves. And we're doing the same now, translating this book, thanks to um, Doctors Jeff Ambler and uh, Fergus Cameron, uh, the authors of the book, giving us permission to translate it now into Urdu for children in Pakistan. The real benefit is we're not just helping children in Pakistan. Uh, if we have Urdu-speaking families in Australia, of course, they'll you know, benefit from it as well, which is why we like to work with partners in Australia to achieve that. So where did you first hear there was such a discrepancy between medical resources in Australia and these resource poor countries? Yeah, it's a great question. It was 2004 and actually the internet, um, we, uh, you know, it was that real time of transition for those older people <laughs> amongst us. Caitlin won't remember a time before the internet, but um, an email um, and I was able to read online stories of people from around the world and I received a uh, a letter put out by the CAH support group of Australia, so the support group here in Australia for people living with congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which is the condition my son has. Um, and in it were some letters by Professor Gary Warren, a paediatric endocrinologist at Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne, a, a real visionary um, doctor who really was committed to doing work with um, doctors and families overseas. Uh, and Michelle Conheiser, the mother of a young girl with CAH in Australia and they wrote, they travelled to Vietnam and they came back and told their stories of children dying and families crying and saying they can't get medicine and uh, it, it just really hit me because I had my son at the school athletics carnival and he was having a great life and it just was so different to my own lived experience that I felt that I needed to know more so I, I contacted them and um, actually arranged to go to Vietnam. And I was just doing my Masters of Public Health. By background, I'm a clinician, a doctor. Um, I knew it was easy to look after a child with CAH. It, it really was easy. It's not, you know, I hate to compare, but compared to diabetes, CAH is a bit of a walk in the park. You know, you just give tablets three times a day. Like, um, everything has its own complexities, but there was no reason children in Vietnam shouldn't be enjoying the same life as my son. So reading the stories of people in these countries um, just really spoke to me and I wanted to go and learn more. And I think it was then talking to people, hearing their stories. We've listened to Sharon, we've listened to Caitlin today. Hearing the stories, it's so powerful. It's important to make sure everyone gets a voice so we can hear those stories. So how important is community in a group like oh, PLAN? With yeah, new volunteers yeah. and people helping you out? Yeah. I, I, I'm passionate about community uh, and community control and community voices and community empowerment and uh, I'm very fortunate to work in Aboriginal health here in Australia and, and Aboriginal community control is, is the Aboriginal community control health sector is something I've learned a lot about, about the importance of, um, you know, Aboriginal health in Aboriginal hands and uh, through my studies of um, public health as well um, was and, and my own lived experience as the mother of a child with a chronic condition, meeting other parents. And I remember actually when our son was diagnosed and we were in the intensive care unit and our paediatric endocrinologist brought an 18-year-old boy in 
uh, who had CAH. And in that moment, I went from thinking, maybe my son won't make it, maybe I don't know what's the future. And I looked at, his name was Tim, and I went, oh, oh, I get it now. Mm. That's where we're going. I see. Uh, oh, I see where the future is. So one, one split second. So we, were, we are part of a community here in Australia, but we have to... For me, the community is much bigger, it's international and uh, uh, it's about connecting communities. Yeah, yep. that's so important. So who are some of the people you've met in your local community that you otherwise wouldn't have if it weren't for Clan? Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Saeed here, um, Dr. Saeed Khan for one. I, I would never have met the Australian Pakistan Medical Association. So Clan had been working with uh, doctors and families in Pakistan since 2007. Uh, they reached out to Clan and asked if we would partner with them. Uh, and we'd been working with them very successfully for a number of years, but we really recognised the importance of connecting with the Pakistani community here in Australia. And, uh, and that's just been such a tremendous privilege. Uh, connecting with health professionals in Australia. Um, we mainly work with paediatricians, uh, Children's Hospital Westmead, Sydney Children's Hospital Network, um, Royal Children's Hospital, uh, and just so many great people. Chris Falico, who introduced us to you. I find in the work that we're involved with, we just end up meeting really great people. So, yeah. Yeah. So, let me take you back to the, these resource poor countries. Mm. Are conditions there improving, and why? Uh, yes, yes they are. Uh, so for example in Vietnam when we started there were uh, about a hundred children in the country with the condition my son has. Uh, they were really just dying but we could see from the fact that there were so many babies and young people that they were being born, they just weren't surviving. Uh, and I'm happy to say at one hospital alone now, there's over a thousand children with this condition. Just in a 10 year period, the changes to access to medicine, healthcare, they're no longer dying. So we have this huge cohort, bigger than in Australia actually, <laughs> of children with this condition. So I think the social economic development in the country in Vietnam has made a difference, but I have to congratulate the doctors and health professionals and health systems in these countries and their commitment to driving change. It is making a difference, and I also really have to, you know, the, acknowledge the importance of, um, you know, working at that UN level and helping communities at the grassroots level have their voice within the, the global non-communicable disease, chronic disease discourse, um, and and driving and change in the policies that governments make. I mean, continuous glucose monitoring, for example, it's just it doesn't exist in these low-income countries. It, it, we've we've still got such inequities to overcome so yeah lots to do so how fortunate are we to live in australia with the medical facilities that we have i think the work that i do on a daily basis is just driven by gratitude uh, every day um, my own son um, you know his health uh, if any of us in our family gets sick we have medicare um, universal health coverage isn't something that exists in every country we are truly blessed in Australia with the health system and I think sometimes it's very easy to complain and very easy to, um, you know, to take it all for granted but the pharma pharmaceutical benefits scheme, healthcare cards, um, assistance affording um, with access to affordable medicines, uh, we, are, we are really truly blessed in Australia and I think just acknowledging what we have um, and being grateful for it just helps me get up every morning and keep going so yeah so you started clan to off the back of trying to help your young child out and now it's saving lives around the world you must be pretty proud of the work you're doing uh, I'm, I'm grateful I think I'm really grateful for the opportunity to bring the voices of people who wouldn't normally have a voice uh, and help them to have a voice. And just this week we had four representatives of CLAN attend a UN civil society hearing in New York uh, and speak at a UN event about their challenges. And we had Indigenous representatives from Canada and Australia and uh, the USA informing that whole process. And we're working with Aboriginal and Indigenous First Nations groups around the world now to help them 
talk about the challenges they're facing with chronic conditions. And I think the opportunity to, to bring different groups of people um, together, communities, combine them and help them have a voice is just really inspiring. It, it keeps me going, yeah. Well, Dr. Kate Armstrong, you're an inspiring human being. Thank ah. you so much for joining us. Thank you, Barnaby. Thanks Thank for the you. opportunity. <coughs> Thank you. See you. Now I'm going to bring in Dr. Saeed Khan. Dr. Khan, welcome. Thank you. Dr. Saeed Khan is a good Australian bloke, a GP. He helps his neighbours by treating their ailments. He, he tries to bring his community together as much as possible, and he's passionate about bringing people together. Dr. Khan is the president of the Council of Australian and Pakistani Medical Associations, an organisation which tries to bring together professional medical groups representing Pakistan in Australia together so they can help, uh, help further medical treatment in Australia and Pakistan. Katmar, Katmar also is passionate about giving their knowledge and education <coughs> to try and build sustainable health and education systems in Pakistan as well. Dr Khan worked hard through his life to become a medical professional but he hasn't kept it all to himself. Dr. Khan shares everything he's learnt with the people around him. He's a very generous and humble human being, and he joins us now in Everyday Greatness. Dr. Khan, welcome. Before I start, I believe you have something you want to say. Well, I would like to say to Josh that uh, have a fun at great Aussie bush camp. Have fun, Josh. <laughs> so, Dr. Khan, what's the best part about being a doctor? Well, um, after 35 years, I'm, I still enjoy to be a doctor. Um, health profession, by virtue of health profession, we enjoy great trust and um, we are the healers in the society. We influence communities and we have this unique human to human contact. Um, the closest, which no other profession enjoys. What's the hardest part about being a doctor? Well, hardest part is when you have lived with patients for many years and then one day you have to break a sad news that they have a terminal illness or illness like diabetes, um, especially in children when they're diagnosed with um, insulin dependent diabetes which is obviously we have heard so much this morning about so I think these are the um, times when we feel very very uh, hard to um, live with. So your group CAPMA like CLAN tries to help resource poor <coughs> countries as well as people in Australia how did CAPMA decide to get on board with CLAN? Well, um, one day I received a call from um, Kate and she came to see, see me at my practice. And we discussed and once we went through each other's aims and objectives, we found that we both are there to serve the humanity and especially um, the plight of um, uh, people in countries which are poorly resourced. So we became friends from then on. So tell me what medical conditions are like in Pakistan these days and what does CAPMA do to help improve those? <coughs> Pakistan is a great country um, with people who are very hard working and resilient. But Pakistan is a divided country. There's a great divide between rich and poor between haves and have-nots. And medical care has, is in similar dire straits. Uh, the rural Pakistan has almost no, not even primary health care available to them. In cities where the health services are available, but half of the population can't afford it. Health is not a priority in Pakistan. Less than 1% of budget is allocated to health. 
consequently, the situation is that the health institutions, hospitals are overcrowded and underfunded. Health, public health measures like provision of clean water, provision of sanitation is very poor. The other measures like immunization and health education is non-existent. Consequently, all the health parameters like infant mortality, maternal mortality, life expectancy is very poor. So there is a need, urgent need I would say, to substantially increase the health funding in, in pa countries like Pakistan so that we can create, we can implement a sustainable, affordable healthcare system for entire population. And Katmar is one voice that tries to do that. Are there other groups of Pakistani medical associations elsewhere in the world? <coughs> well, um, CAPMA was formed last year. It, uh, it has four associations um, in, in Australia which have joined together. Uh, and we have vision to combine efforts with North American Association, which is APNA, and European associations. And we would like to combine all efforts to provide assistance to Pakistan and other countries so that we can help whatever we have learned here in Australia um, and countries like Australia, we can transmit those services to Pakistan and similar countries. So Katma does more than just try to provide medical education and expertise. What other projects do you have at the moment or have you had? Well, uh, l last year we raised about $30,000 and we provided that uh, uh, money in, in conjunction with CLAN to National Institute of uh, Child Health in Karachi, Pakistan. We have provided a dialysis machine. We have uh, done some translations of booklets which are of enormous help because uh, there's no literature available um, in those languages. Uh, we have provided medications for one condition which is not available in Pakistan for whole one year for the all patients and similar. Um, we provide services in some hospitals where whenever we, our members go there, we provide free services, uh, professional services um, in those hospitals. So how important do you think it is to use your position as a GP and the president of CAPMA to give back to your local community? Well, giving is a pleasure. Giving gives you sense of achievement, happiness and purpose in your life and that is all we are trying to do. We are blessed in Australia as Kate said we work in, in ideal conditions in Australia and in other developed countries and we would like to see similar conditions in our countries where we come from and our heart aches when we see the plight of those countries and we would like to see some changes there and CAPMA is, is trying to organize all the health professionals in Australia under one banner so that we can create a strong voice to, to advocate the plight of these countries so that um, we can implement a better health system in those countries. And how important are the, your, the small communities that make up CAPMA in the work that you do, the projects you undertake? Well, I've, uh, I think it's surprisingly Pakistani community is, is a, a, a great donors. They, they donate, you know, quite open-heartedly. And um, 
there are examples um, in Karachi, in Lahore, all over Pakistan. I'll give you two examples. Um, in Karachi, um, Dr. Adibul Hassan Rizvi has created one of the largest organ transplant, especially kidney transplant institute in Asia. In Lahore, Shokat Khanum Hospital, which is a cancer hospital, is all by donation. There's no government you know, involvement in there. And it's one of the largest hospital, cancer hospital in, in, in Pakistan. So people of Pakistan donate and a good amount of you know, uh, money and other forms all the time. So what, what are the projects you guys have coming up at CAPMA? Have you got Australian <coughs> projects or overseas? Well, we have um, supported here uh, Fred Holo's foundation, Red Cross, uh, Victor Chang Institute, um, and many others. Uh, Edi Foundation, um, Clan. Um, in future, we want to continue these projects. But along with that, we would like to see the real change where at the government level, there is a increase funding in the health system because without that the entire population cannot be provided a better health care. Dr. Saeed Khan, you're doing incredible work. I want to thank you so much for being on Everyday Greatness today and good luck with the, your, your work. Thank you, Varnabi. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Khan, and thank you to our other guests today, Dr. Kate Armstrong from Clan and Sharon and Caitlin Gooding. And thank you guys for watching. I hope you can join us again next month I'll be talking to four people who are adding incredible value to the world. Gail O'Brien from Chris O'Brien Lifehouse. Rowie McAvoy is flying out from New Zealand to have a chat with her personal ray of sunshine. Kyleen Anderson from ABC. And Hayley Hornitsky from the New South Wales Cancer Council. So please join us at 10am on the first Saturday of next month. Thank you to our major sponsor, ARA Group and Deluxe Studios. And I hope that if, if you can't join us next time, Please walk down the street proud of being an everyday Joe Bag of Donuts. Thank you. solutions for facilities and infrastructure.